Good morning, Capshaw, and happy Mother's Day. I'm Jessica, welcome to In The Know. If you are a guest with us, either in person or online, we want to welcome you and thank you for joining with us. Now, let's find out what's going on around campus. Parent-child dedications will be on Sunday, June the 26th, and will take place during our worship service. Parents, if you are interested in dedicating your child, please reach out to Roberta Fox for more information at roberta.fox at capshaw.org. The last day to register your child is on June the 12th. Years ago, former Capshaw member Helen Balch was inspired while away at a retreat at Shaco Springs. Desiring to have something similar close by, Helen donated the land that is now known as Camp Helen to the Limestone Baptist Association. Recently, LBA renovated the area and even moved their offices from Athens to be housed at Camp Helen. This beautiful camp has strong ties to Capshaw and we are excited to use it for our church picnic on May 15th from 2 to 7 p.m. You may come and go as you please, and we will have lots of fun activities for your whole family to participate in. There's a swimming pool for swimming, fishing, two playgrounds, basketball, and we'll have several yard games that you can enjoy. Bingo will be located in the covered pavilion, and barrel train cars will be ready and waiting for the kiddos. You'll meet by the camp office in the gravel roundabout. We'll be serving dinner from 4.30 to 6 p.m. And Kona Ice will be available for purchase from 5 to 6 p.m. On the softball field, we will have a kickball game and a wiffle ball game. Don't forget to bring your fishing equipment and your lawn chairs. This is going to be an event you won't want to miss out on with your church family. For a detailed schedule of events and to register, please visit us at capshaw.org slash events. We hope to see you there. You can get general information, find out about upcoming events, as well as give. If you have any questions, you can email us at info at capshaw.org. I hope you all have a great week. Now let's get ready to worship. Good morning, Capshaw, and happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. If you are able, please stand with me for to the reading of God's Word. Today's scripture comes from Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's continue the worship. And I count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will 
Elder Craig Capps beat me to it, but happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. We don't give a lot of um, imperative from this stage, uh, but gentlemen, there is an imperative today. Uh, spoil the mothers. It can just be you watching the children while they take a nap, right? Anything, but um, <laughs> there's amen going on. <laughs> but um, enjoy your naps. Enjoy lunches in extraordinarily crowded restaurants and all that that great stuff. And I'm going to do something else that I don't really do. Today is also my mother's birthday. So, so put camera one right up on me right there. Happy birthday, happy birthday, Mother's Day, Mom. There we go. All right. Say I'm a very good boy. All right. <laughs> my name is Chris Moncrief, and I am the worship pastor here at Capshaw. I'd like to direct your attention to the Connect card in the seat in front of you. Um, you can fill that out with any sort of prayer needs or struggles or anything that you're going through and just kind of let us know how we can pray with you and partner with you. Also, if you're, if you're new and you would like more information, if there's anything we can do there, that's a good place to start. I will tell you that all of these prayer needs, our staff meets every Tuesday morning to pray over them. And tomorrow night, our elders will meet and we will also pray through all of these. So, um, like I said, please let, let us know your, your needs and your struggles. Uh, you saw the video earlier. I'm just going to briefly mention the church picnic is next Sunday. There will be more specifics coming up a little bit later. Now, I want to do something else, switch gears here. As you're aware, God has been, for the last few years, um, calling and raising up young men to be future church leaders um, from this church. Uh, Jacob Dean, I'm Jacob Dean, Jacob Dearman, I get them confused. Jacob Dearman is now at a um, church in Pennsylvania as the student director. Um, our very own current intern, Logan Cobb, is in all likelihood going to be heading out the door very soon. The churches are fighting over him. And um, our very own Jared Dean, who was surrendered to a call in missions, um, he graduated from Midwestern yesterday. So these are men that God has called up and they have surrendered to ministry right from out of our student ministry here. And finally, um, Sean and Sarah Speakman, you remember Sean, the guy that used to run all over the stage, right? So they are actually here with us today. They're right over here, and they're highly embarrassed. But make sure you tell them how much you love them and how proud you are of them um, before they, they get out of here and head back to... Um, they are currently at Grace Bible Church in Shorewood, Illinois, right? And um, so could not be more proud. God is good. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's worship together. Where'd it go?
Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy.
hold me fast justice has been satisfied he will hold me fast raise me Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of God's redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good Strain to be, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Oh, beautiful stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead and have a seat, church family. So good to see you today and friends of Capshaw. Uh, let me add my welcome to uh, Pastor Chris's and uh, just really encourage you, if you are relatively new with us, to uh, fill out the Connect card. Just gives us, gives us a chance to get to know you a little bit, and uh, we would love to pray for you if you would add your requests on there as well. Of course, anybody, uh, if you've been around the church for years and years, please also put your prayer requests on there. We would love to to pray for you and uh, you heard the, uh, the opportunity coming up, the church picnic, that is next Sunday, 
Um, again, it's a, there's a window there. You don't have to be there the whole time between 2 and 7, but we have a variety of things scheduled. You can find out at Facebook, find out at our website all the things from, as uh, Jessica mentioned, from wiffle ball to uh, bingo to kickball to dinner will be provided at uh, 4.30 to 6 or so. So please come out for that. And, uh, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't also say Happy Mother's Day to all of you uh, mothers out there and having a, a, an incredible mother myself and the most amazing uh, wife and mother of my children. I'm just so grateful for uh, those, those women who are shepherding and loving and nurturing and caring for those in their family. Of course, uh, if you've never given birth to a child, but you are serving as a mother type to those around you, you are loved and appreciated and respected, and uh, we're just so grateful uh, for the uh, amazing women who are part of this church. I don't know um, if you like poetry or not, um, but the arts, uh, by which I mean poetry and painting and sculpting and film and music and literature and all of those things, uh, the arts are a very good way for us to, to get a, a different glimpse, maybe sort of under-the-surface glimpse of the beauty and character of God. Um, even really since the Reformation, the arts have been viewed as, as a, a fantastic way to really focus on, again, those characteristics of God that uh, maybe we, we, we often neglect. Um, and I like poetry. I like, I like the good stuff, that is. Um, I'm going to read uh, one of my favorite poems, and it's in honor of mothers. And then it's, it's not written by a Christian, but I'll explain to you in a moment um, why, why I'm choosing uh, to read this. But I love this poem, and I love what it communicates, even if the author uh, didn't intend so. So let me read uh, for you. It's about three minutes, but it's called The Lanyard by Billy Collins. It goes like this. The other day I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room, moving as if underwater from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, when I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one into the past more suddenly, a past where I sat at a workbench, at a camp, by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid long, thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift from my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard, or wear one, if that's what you did with them. But that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. She nursed me in many a sick room, lifted spoons of medicine to my lips, laid cold face cloths on my forehead, and then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim. And I, in turn, presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here's clothing and a good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the worn truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hand, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even." Now, you didn't laugh at that at all. There's some funny parts in there. Clearly, you don't like poetry. Um, but what I like about that is uh, it, it really captures, I think, in a beautiful poetic way, naturally, this idea. How foolish is it for us to think that by presenting a lanyard to our mother, we're now even? And I think the same goes with our, our gifts and our works that we present to God. This really, I think, accentuates the power of the gospel. We do something, we think... Maybe this will make me right with God. Maybe this will make us even, so to speak. Uh, and yet God is so gracious and merciful that he even receives our gifts and lets us know that he delights in them, meager as they are. Okay, well, 
I'll never read another poem to you, but um, anyway, let's pray. We'll get into the ministry of the Word. That's what you're waiting on. I get it. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for the arts. Thank you for uh, poetry and literature and theater and drama and music and film and sculptures and painting and all these beautiful things that really accentuate and reflect your beauty. You are perfectly beautiful glorious in splendor, majestic in holiness. Everything you do is pure and right and true. And Father, I pray that you would capture our minds and our hearts again with your beauty and your mercy. Give us wisdom now and humility as we approach your word. Help us to lean in as, and listen, listening to the very God who has spoken to us, who didn't have to speak, but has done so out of his kindness and love for us. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, turn with me to 1 Kings 19. This is the third week in our series called Two Friends and One Hero. And we're looking at the prophets Elijah and Elisha. And we're seeing some of the miraculous ways that God provided for and delivered his people Israel. But also seeing how these prophets actually point us to Jesus Christ. Uh, just a heads up, we typically have three points. Um, uh, today, just one point that I'll give to you toward the end of the sermon. Um, we'll also celebrate the Lord's table, so that means we're going to have a bit of a shorter section. We're going to cover verses uh, 1 through 8 of 1 Kings 19. Just a two-minute uh, background here lesson. We've talked about this before, but remember, uh, the nation of Israel is in a very dark place at this time, at the time of this writing. Everywhere you turned, if you were in Israel, you noticed that there were Baals, set up everywhere. People were worshiping the false god of Baal. Baal was a, a bit of an odd-looking god, so to speak. Most of the statues of Baal resembled something like a kind of a thin or scrawny human with a bull head. Now, there are a variety of renderings of this. Here's what uh, the Baals look like. Just give you one example. Uh, Baal was the, the god of fertility and also the god of rain, among other things. And the statues of Baal were everywhere, which, which actually angered, naturally, uh, the living God of the Bible. And at this time, the time of this writing, Ahab was the king of Israel. And Ahab has done more to anger the living God than any king who had preceded him. He has uh, erected these, these altars and statues of Baal everywhere. Baal was actually the god of, the, of his wife Jezebel, of her region where she came from. And Jezebel... Ahab's wife was actually worse than Ahab. Uh, she was uh, the most evil woman that we've seen uh, to date in the scriptures. She, uh, she and Ahab together were running Israel, the nation of Israel, into the ground. And if you were here last week, you saw that God called the prophet Elijah to a showdown against the prophets of Baal, a passage of scripture that uh, Pastor Brandon covered so well. And so God tells Elijah to go uh, do battle, so to speak, with the gods of Baal, and ultimately the God of heaven and earth, the God of the Bible, would defeat the false god Baal uh, by raining down fire from heaven, and then Elijah and would have all the prophets of Baal, some 450 of them, slaughtered by the sword. Ahab, the king, he was there for all that. He saw all of that. Jezebel was not. So she was at home in the palace. And when Ahab returned to the palace to give his wife an update, she was not happy. So look with me, if you would, at 1 Kings 19. I'll start by reading verses 1 through 3. Here reads the word of the Lord. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he, this is Elijah, was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now I want to pause for a moment. Uh, Ahab is stunned by what took place. And we saw, you know, we won't get into the earlier section, but we saw uh, from last week that he seems ready actually to believe in Yahweh, the God of Israel. He's so overwhelmed, he's so taken by this miraculous display of power by Yahweh that he seems ready to believe. 
Uh, in fact, at the end of the great showdown between the prophets of Baal and the prophets uh, in Elijah, God's prophet, Elijah tells the Ahab, the king, where to go and what to do, and Ahab listens to him and follows his orders. Ahab actually signs off on the killing of all the prophets of Baal, the prophets of his wife Jezebel's cherished religion. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. So Ahab signs off on this massacre of 450 prophets of Baal, but when Ahab gets home and tells his wife about it, Jezebel, he totally uh, ignores, doesn't say anything about his complicity in this whole thing, but he blames it all on Elijah. When Jezebel hears, she's outraged. She's so mad that she puts a hit out on Elijah's life, uh, pronounces, invokes upon herself what we know in the Scriptures called a self-maledictory oath. She says, if he is not dead by tomorrow, then the same should happen to me. I should lose my life. Now, my question is, what is Ahab doing here? Why the sudden shrinking back from his initial conviction? Why is Jezebel running the show? After all, Ahab is the king of Israel. One commentator says, King Ahab was a chameleon, or perhaps a spineless jellyfish. He ought to have been telling Jezebel everything that God had done, not everything that Elijah had done. Yet because Ahab was afraid of his wife, he was careful to pin the blame for the death of her prophets on Elijah. Now, this is not the main point of this passage, and I'm not going to go all Mark Driscoll on you, but I, I do have to say this because I, I can't overlook what I've seen here and in, in, in leading up to this point in the Old Testament. When, when men stop lovingly leading uh, at home, their respective wives and children, disaster follows. When, when Ahab's approach actually to marriage and family is, is the approach of many men today, uh, we have, well, uh, Darren Patrick famously said a few years ago, we have in the church today a man crisis, a man crisis. When men stop investing in their sons and daughters spiritually and stop loving and leading their wives sacrificially, stop pouring into the next generation, it leads to ruin. Now, of course, in, in Israel's case, as we've seen the last few weeks, it leads to national ruin. Now, sadly, recently we've seen so many bad examples of leadership uh, in the church and, and in homes. Uh, we're being told by those in our culture that all masculinity is toxic masculinity and that all leadership is abusive leadership. But this is not the case at all. There is a kind of humble, sacrificial, courageous, and loving leadership that's still leadership that's God's design and, in fact, necessary for the church and the home to, to thrive. In fact, without it, the church will not thrive. Without it, your home will not thrive. All right, back to the story here. Elijah is in Jezreel, which is in Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, and when he finds out that Jezebel is out to kill him, he rocks or runs from Jezreel to Be Beersheba. Now, this is 130 miles, so this is a long way. This is a long way to go. Uh, Beersheba was a little town on Judah's frontier. He's going from the northern kingdom of Israel to the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, Beersheba was a gateway into the Negev desert, which is where Elijah will find himself here uh, next. Elijah is deathly afraid. Even though he's just seen God do this incredible miracle, you know, bringing down fire from heaven, Elijah is afraid of this woman. He's discouraged. He's overwhelmed with doubt. So he heads south uh, towards Sinai, which is also called Mount Horeb, uh, which was the traditional site of divine revelation. It was there that Moses was given the law of God, the ten words, the ten commandments. And then let's look at what happens in verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough, O Lord. Now take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. So now th just think about this for, my, for a minute. What Elijah has just recently seen, this incredible outpouring and display of the living God's power and glory, and he, he runs in, in abject fear. He runs out into the wilderness, sits, uh, sits, out, sits down 
uh, under a broom tree, which is a kind of tree that really only grew in the most desolate uh, areas. It sometimes would get as high as eight or nine feet tall, would be the only shade available in those remote areas. And here he is sitting under this tree, and he pleads with God to die. More specifically, he pleads with God to take his life. Why? Because in verse 4 he says, I am no better than my father's. Now what does this mean? Some argue, a lot of interpretations on this. I don't claim to have the authoritative one. Some argue that it's pride that Elijah is suffering from. Others say it's, it's mental and physical exhaustion. Uh, some say that he was going through uh, depression. Uh, some say that he is, quote, despairing his calling. In other words, he wants out of vocational ministry, out of pastoral ministry altogether. But I think Elijah is hopeless and despondent for a different reason, frankly. He feels like a total failure. Just like his ancestors before him, his fathers, as he alludes to, he's not made any lasting difference in his ministry. He's not brought the people of Israel back to prolonged obedience or the worship of the true God. In his mind, he has totally failed to meet the expectations of him. Practically immediately after this big showdown, after God brings down fire from heaven in response to Elijah's prayer, the people of Israel return to their rampant idolatry. Their mountaintop experience barely lasts until they get down the mountain, so to speak, and then all of a sudden, the the, the Baals, the statues of Baal are everywhere again, and the people have totally forgotten about the true and living God. And Elijah thinks to himself, why, why? I mean, why do I even bother? Why am I wasting my time here? Lord, just take me now. The work I am doing is pointless. If you've been around Capshaw very long, you've uh, undoubtedly heard us talk about the law-gospel distinction. Uh, it's a way of making sense of the whole Bible and how it all fits together. In fact, if you go back several centuries from John Calvin to Martin Luther, 150 years after that, C.F.W. Walther, to present day, uh, Sinclair Ferguson, Michael Horton, and I could go on and on. That Many have said, all these people have said, that the greatest failure that a preacher can make is the failure to distinguish law and gospel. So what does all that mean? Well, when we talk about law, we're talking about everything in the Scriptures that tells us what God instructs us to do. So everything that God tells us to do, every command, every expectation, uh, every requirement, every rule, um, it's all law. So even every positive and negative command, all law. So think about some of the laws and the rules, the commands in Scripture, right? Love God. uh, Love your neighbor. Do not murder. Do not uh, bear false witness against your your neighbor. Practice hospitality. Honor one another. Pray for one another. Uh, carry one another's burdens. Confess your sins to one another. There are hundreds of these commands in the Scripture. The list goes on and on. They all fit in the category of law, what God has told us to do. And what God has told us to do, the law, is good. The law is holy and just and good, Romans 7. It reveals to us the character of God. It shows us the way of human flourishing. It guides us. It is a light to our path. It shows us the best way to live, and and it points us to Jesus. So the law is good, but the law always accuses, without exception. It always condemns. It shows us all the ways that we have failed. It magnifies our shortcomings. The Apostle Paul talks about this so beautifully in Romans chapter 6 through 8. The law shows us all the ways. It's a mirror. It shows us all the ways we have fallen short of God's standard of perfection. And the law fails to produce in us any power to change. Commands, demands, expectations, rules, requirements, they may bring about external conformity, even maybe a polite external, quote, goodness, but they never transform anyone at the heart level. It's true at home. It's true in our relationships. It's true in our marriage. It's true in parenting. It's true at work. It's true in life. 
Just telling someone what to do may get them to submit to you, but you never get to the heart level. Uh, in his new book uh, called Parenting, which we're giving out to all the parents who are part of our parent-child dedication here in a, a month or so, um, Paul Tripp talks about the powerlessness of the law. He says this, This is what every parent of every child needs to understand. The law does a very good job of exposing your child's sin, but it has no power whatsoever to deliver your child from it. The law has no ability to rescue your child from the power of sin's grip. The law has no ability to give your child a new heart. The law has no ability to create the lasting change in your child that every parent longs for. The law cannot and will not rescue, redeem, and restore your child, but that's exactly what every child needs. So if you're going to be a tool of change in God's hand in the lives of your children, you need more than God's law in your personal parenting toolbox. Now, this is not to say kids don't, I'm not saying kids don't need rules, right? Kids need rules. I'm not saying that we can't uh, put on our kids reasonable expectations, right? There's, there's nothing wrong with that at all, right? Commands, demands, expectations, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying they will never change anyone at the heart level. They always accuse. And it's not just true for children. It's true for all of us. The law of God, good, holy, and just as it is, always accuses us. Now, I've talked about this before Many times, the law being good and beautiful while at the same time accusing us, and I've been asked by, sometimes by frustrated people, how can that be so? Like, how can the law be good and beautiful and just while at the same time always accusing? And I've tried to think of a number of illustrations. This is the best one that I've come up with, and you can come up to me afterward. You probably have a better one, but this is what I was thinking. When my, my oldest son was 12, he played in official Little League, and um, he, because I, I wanted to be around him, at, you know, I still want to be around him, but that time in terms of shepherding and develop, so I was the head coach of the official Little League team. We had three other assistant coaches, and they were, you know, they were all, they were all good guys, and I enjoyed being around them, but, but as the head coach, what that meant was I was responsible to put people in their positions, I was responsible to do the instructing and the, the building up and, and so on, and, and I had on that two, team, I had my, my two favorite pitchers. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Sawyer, who was uh, 12, and he was a real flamethrower. I mean, this guy just brought heat. I mean, he wasn't very accurate, so he would always he would walk a lot of guys, and he would bean a lot of guys, you know, hit guys and so on. But, man, he could absolutely bring it. And so I would start him. He was a right-hander. Uh, I would start him, and, of course, now all the kids are terrified <laughs> after that because they don't know if they're going to get hit or not. And then I would bring in my other favorite pitcher. was actually my son, Quinn, who was 12, he was, le- he was a left-hander. He had incredible precision, but very little pace. And so these guys, they're up there. They're scared to death. They're going to get hit. They're ducking. And then I bring in my son, who's a lefty, who just throws strikes right down the middle. I mean, it was slow, uh, but it was, you know, I just, it was so much fun. Those days were great. But what I would have to do is sometimes I'd have to go as the coach, the head coach, also the pitching coach, and I'd have to go out and I'd have to encourage one of the guys on the mound. And I might say to them, hey, you got to stay on top of the ball in your delivery. Otherwise, the pitches are going to sail on you. And I might say something to them like, hey, be, be, watch out for your body language because your body language suggests that you've already been defeated. Or I might say to them, you know, keep an eye on your posture, right? You're dipping, which is going to cause, cause the ball to go up, whatever it was. So what I was doing is I was giving them instructions on a better way to pitch, right? The way that would, at least in theory, lead to flourishing and better results, but they, they never wanted to see me come out to the mound. And I was as patient and kind, and I would say, look, you're, you're, I have you out here for a reason. We, we, we're depending on you, and we're, we're, you know, you're the right guy. You have the stuff. You've been chosen for this moment, all that sort of stuff. But they still didn't want to see me come out because even though I'm giving them instruction and encouragement, there was a sense that it was also what? It was also accusing. Because if I say, stay on top of the ball, what does that mean? You're not on top of the ball. If I say, watch your posture, it means you're you're, you're slouching, you're dipping. If I say to them, keep an eye on your body language, what does it mean? Your body language says that you've already already lost. And so even though I was giving them good instructions, again, you, you can find ways this analogy breaks down for sure. But even though I'm giving them good instructions, things that would promote their flourishing, 
they always took it as a corrective. And it was, in a sense, a corrective. Well, this is how it is with the law. It's a beautiful thing. Again, it shows us the way of human flourishing. It reveals to us the very character of God from whom the law flows. But it always shows us how we're failing. Now, this is here we are in a sin-cursed world. We have the law of God, again, this beautiful thing. And along with the big L law, so I'm going to call it the big L law, there are a hundred other little L laws that condemn us. You're thinking, what does it have to do with Elijah? I'm going to get back to that in just a second. There are a hundred other little L laws that condemn us. These are the demands and expectations that we feel every day from our culture, from those around us, and even from ourselves. Little L laws show up everywhere. There are, there are messengers inanimate messengers of little l laws everywhere. The bathroom scale is a, is a messenger of a little l law. Because you stand on the bathroom scale and what does it tell you? you? What you think is, I'm not where I should be. The report card, right? Your report card is, brings you little l law. Nutrition labels. I mean, and again, these are, none of these are bad things. Nutrition labels. You look at nutrition labels you say, look, that's too much whatever. Sugar, fat, fructose, whatever it is. It says you're not eating as healthy as you could be. Um, I'm, I'm with, uh, and this is not a promotion or a commercial, but I'm with State Farm and for my auto insurance, and I have a little, um, I don't know what you call it, some little thing that I put in my car that tells me every few weeks how I'm doing in my driving, right? Um, you know, am I using my, my going fast enough, too fast, whatever. That is a, is a purveyor of a little L law. Performance reviews at work. Right, pay stubs. You look at your pay stub. You say, "I I could be doing more." Retirement accounts, social media, all of these entities—they're not bad in themselves. Are little l laws that, again, not bad things, but they remind us of all the ways that we're not measuring up, all the ways that we're not meeting everyone else's and our own expectations. Little law says little l laws say things like this: "You should you shall be thin." Thou shalt be beautiful. Thou shalt be the best mom in your neighborhood. Thou shalt never get tired. Thou shalt have a perfect family. Thou shalt always be at your most Instagrammable best. Now, what does this have to do with Elijah in the desert? Well, here's Elijah on his way to Mount Sinai, where the law of God was delivered to Moses. No doubt Elijah had on his mind all the ways that he'd failed to live up to God's law, that big L law. But he was also plagued by all the little L laws that haunt us. Why couldn't I have done more? Why couldn't I have been like the other prophets? Why couldn't I have seen more success? Why couldn't I have been stronger and less afraid? Why couldn't I have been, uh, made more of a difference? Elijah was overwhelmed with his shortcomings, his feelings of failure, all the expectations that he didn't meet, expectations of others and those he placed on himself. And he's so overwhelmed, so crushed by the burden of all of these laws that he wants to die. Now, this is the prophet, remember, who for... Three years practically swam in the miracles of God. He was fed twice a day with ravens. Uh, he, he was fed by a widow with jars of food that never went empty. He raised a boy from the dead. There was all that stuff we saw last week concerning that great showdown. All of that, and he still feels like a failure. He says, just kill me, God. I'm, not, I'm just like my father's. I've done nothing more than my ancestors have done. I've not made a difference. I've not pre brought people around to the, the joyful and, and long-lasting worship of you. All that he can see is what he was not able to do instead of what he was able to do by God's grace and power. All the little laws, little L and big L laws, hounded him to the point that he wanted to die. Now look at how God responds, verses 5 through 8. And he lay down, and he slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. 
And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Apparently, uh, in my sermons, I mention too often that I, I like ice cream. And I say that because I will, on any given night, get a, get a random text from someone in our church with a picture of the ice cream that they're enjoying that night. And I don't know if they're trying to inspire me or mock me or, you know, make me jealous or what, but I do get these pictures um, of the flavors. I'll sometimes get questions, you know, what, what ice cream are you having tonight by way of text. So, yeah, I like ice cream you know, there, okay? Um, but I'm not a huge, I don't really like cake so much, um, but we did buy, uh, we bought a nothing bunt cake from our, our neighbor, who, a high school football player, fundraiser, and it, it was delicious. But, you know, generally speaking, I'm not a really huge, big, I'm not a big fan of cake. But what about a cake baked by God himself? Talk about the master chef. I mean, this is the God who knows every ingredient on earth, where it comes from, and what effect it has on the taste buds. So a worn-out Elijah is awakened by the touch of an angel, pointing him to a cake baked by God on hot coals, ready for his consumption. So Elijah eats it. He eats this cake. Uh, and right after he eats it, he goes to sleep again. And the angel tapped him again and said, look, there's more. You got, you're going to need more strength. Eat more. So Elijah wakes up and eats more. And then is strengthened enough to make it 40 days and 40 nights on his journey to Mount Horeb or Sinai, the Mount of God. Now, it sounds eerily similar to another prophet of the Old Testament and uh, someone else. We need to ask, I think, why is this detail about hot cakes included in this story? Well, throughout the Bible, God's provision of physical food is often a metaphor for God's provision of the spiritual needs of his children. How did Adam and Eve know that God delighted in them, that, that he approved of them, that they were objects of his favor? Well, they're given fruit from all the trees of the garden, except one. How does the psalmist know that God will provide for him spiritually, even when he's being chased down by killers? He writes, you prepare a table before me, food for me in the presence of my enemies. What's the metaphor that the songwriter used to capture uh, the way that God satisfies the souls of his people? He says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Remember when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, how long did he go without food? Forty days and forty nights. And what did he say when the devil tempted him? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What's the point? What's the point? Physical hunger is meant to show us how dependent we are upon God. And God's physical provision of food, of bread, is meant to point to an even greater reality, the faithfulness of God's spiritual provisions for those who depend on Him, a provision which finds its ultimate fulfillment in the one who would call Himself the living bread, the bread of life. What does Jesus say in John 6? He says, As the living Father sent me... And I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not the bread the fathers ate and died. He says, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus is not talking about physical nourishment here. He's talking about spiritual nourishment. He's talking about being satisfied at the soul level. He's talking about God's spiritual provision. Whoever feasts on Jesus will never be lacking spiritually. He or she will experience eternal peace with God. Now, again, you might say, what does this have to do with Elijah? Well, Elijah is sitting under a tree begging God to die because he feels like such a failure. The law hangs over him like a noose. The little L laws are nagging at him, flooding him with guilt, shame, self-loathing, and personal disgust. And what does God do? He bakes him a cake. Elijah says, kill me, God. Just do away with my life. Please end my life. And God says, no, get up 
and get your cake on. This is, what, this is the way God provides. And those physical provisions to a dying and law-crushed man, through those, God points Elijah to a greater provision yet to come, the living bread, the sending of the one who would actually satisfy him at the soul level, and the one who would fulfill the whole law for all sinners and sufferers who would believe. So here's our single point this morning. God delights in encouraging his hopeless and broken servants by giving them good things, physical provisions that point to a greater provision, forgiveness and a future through his son. And I know it's a long point, but I really believe this is what we're to take from this section. God delights in encouraging his hopeless and broken servants by giving them good things, physical provisions that point to a greater provision, forgiveness and a future through His Son, for those who are crushed under the burden of the law. The weight of all the commands of Scripture, every single do this and don't do that, God sent His Son who perfectly obeyed all of those commands so that by faith we could be considered fully and totally obedient. See, Jesus not only had to die for our sins, He had to live for our righteousness. Jesus perfectly kept the law of God throughout His entire life, without a single exception, even to the point of dying on a cross for our sins. And His obedience is actually reckoned or credited or imputed to us, however you want to say it, when we believe. In other words, if you are in Christ this morning, God sees you as totally and fully obedient in every way because of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 reads, But by His doing, you are are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In other words, our union with Christ is, means that in Christ Jesus, we are considered by the Father to have all the same perfect wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption that Jesus possessed. It doesn't mean that we always think perfectly wisely. It doesn't mean that we always act perfectly righteously. Of course we don't. It doesn't mean that we possess all of these attributes in our personal existence right now here on earth. We fail continually, as a matter of fact. But we are represented by Christ and have become these things by virtue of our union with Him. The law of God no longer condemns us because Jesus completely fulfilled every aspect of it. So men, when we fail to lead in our homes, when we fail to lead and love our wives sacrificially and joyfully, Jesus was the perfect leader for us. I know he wasn't married, but he was tempted in every way like we, and yet without sin. Jesus was the perfect leader for us. When we say things we shouldn't, Jesus used his tongue perfectly in our place. When we fall so short of loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jesus loved the Father perfectly with all heart, soul, mind, and strength for us. And it's the same, with the, the same is true for the little L laws. Every demand and expectation that everyone puts on us and we heap on ourselves the pressure to look different and to weigh less and to earn more and to succeed faster, God says you have and already are everything you need to be because of Jesus. All those laws, big L and little L, they accuse us. But the gospel, which we're so careful to distinguish here between law and gospel, the gospel comforts us. The gospel heartens us. The gospel encourages us. The gospel tells us all that God has done for us in Christ. As Martin Luther said so beautifully in his Heidelberg Disputation, the law brings the wrath of God, kills, reviles, accuses, judges and condemns everything that is not in Christ. The law says, do this, and it's never done. Gospel or grace says, believe in this, and everything is already done. The gospel announces for those in Christ, you have been bought with a price. 
You have been adopted by God. You are at this very moment a son or daughter of the great King. You are alive in Christ, indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You have been and forever will be loved with an everlasting love. And how does God show that love? In a thousand ways. For Elijah, it was a cake baked on hot coals that pointed him to the coming Messiah, the one who would call himself the bread of life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to realize this morning that as we are in Christ, we are right with you. And when you see us, you see us as those who have perfectly obeyed all your commands because of Jesus. Positionally, we are holy. Now, we know God practically, we blow it every day and every hour of every day. But thank you that our standing with you is secure, that you see us through the lens of your Son, and you delight in us, and you love us, and you approve of us. Not because of us, not through us, but through Christ in us. Help us to believe it even now as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. Or actually, that's coming up in a moment, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to invite the servers to come forward now with our, uh, the Lord's table. Uh, and, you know, this is when you, when you come out of a, a message that speaks so clearly about God's provision, physical food doesn't require a lot of setup. But let me just say this. When you, as you receive your elements, just hold on to them. We'll consume them together. But just remember... This is, this is pointing us, this, this tangible demonstration, this food is pointing us to the sufficiency of Christ's work, the death of Christ, but also as we look forward to His return. So take it, spend a moment just reflecting and praise to God, and, and I'll lead us through in just a second. Well, the shed body of Christ means that there's no longer any condemnation for those 
who are in him. Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father in heaven, what a, what a matchless gift you have given us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you for your perfect obedience even unto death. And we thank you that right now you are exalted at the right hand of the Father, praying for us, enabling us, strengthening us, comforting us, speaking for us. Lord, we pray and we thank you so much for that. Holy Spirit, pierce our hearts, captivate our hearts with your love, the love of the Father. Pour the love of the Father into our hearts continually, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Why don't you stand and join us in, in worship? What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. Okay. 
Well, I'm so glad that you uh, spent the morning with us on this Mother's Day. Moms, please know that you are loved, and uh, we're so grateful for you. Um, you can take one of the ways that we respond is we respond by singing to God's goodness. We respond by joyful and spontaneous obedience. We respond by fellowship and prayer, and then also by giving back a portion of what He's given us. You can see uh, all the ways to do that behind me. I hope that's a part of your regular rhythm. Uh, to give in a faithful way, a generous way, a sacrificial way. Let me send you out with a benediction from the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. He says this, Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Have a great afternoon.